sure a lot of people here know uh, who Leonard Roy Frank is, but uh, those of you who don't, uh, Leonard Roy Frank is a, a Brooklynite. He was born in 1932. In 1963, in a San Francisco suburb, he was forcibly administered 50 insulin comas and 35 electroshocks, which destroyed a large part of his memory. He's been a human rights activist and opponent of all forms of coercive psychiatry since 1972, when he joined the staff of Mad Madness Network News, and two years later co-founded the Network Against Psychiatric Assault. Along the way, he's edited two books on shock and eight collections of quotations, including Random House Webster's Quotationary. In 2011, he edited the Zaz Quotationary, The Wit and Wisdom of Thomas Zaz, a Kindle ebook. He started tweeting mostly his own aphorisms in October 2012, and he has lived in San Francisco since 1959. Welcome, Leonard. Thank you all very much for being here. I feel very comfortable amongst my friends and brothers and sisters. I feel very comfortable being amongst my friends and brothers and sisters. This is really quite an occasion for me as it, as it is probably for most of you. To have the opportunity to stand in opposition to, to, to what, what psychiatry is all about. Matthew went into my story a little bit. I want to touch on the relationship between what happened, the relationship of religion and psychiatry to each other. It's really not much of a relationship, it's more like a disconnect. Because that was the major reason, I believe, for my being locked up. Because I was charting a new course for myself, spiritually speaking. I come out to San Francisco <clears throat> and had come across a book by Mahatma Gandhi. It was called The Autobiography of Mahatma Gandhi, My Experiments with Truth. This was a mind-opening book for me. And as a result of reading that book, I adopted a lot of the teachings in that book, particularly nonviolence and spirituality and the, and, the, and the idea of our having a responsibility to one another, to help, and to serve, and to love one another, which I believe is the purpose of our being here on the planet. As a result of reading that book, I really went through a lot of personal changes. Psychiatry calls this a personality change. For me, it was a religious conversion. I was adopting a new way of looking at the world and looking at myself. My parents at that time were living in New York City, opposite San Francisco. And they thought that something had gone terribly wrong with me because I was no longer being my old self. My old self had been a, a businessman, a real estate broker. I was no longer interested in that. I was interested in finding out more about who I was and what the world was all about. In order to do that, in order to do that I needed time by myself to read and study. I didn't need any <clears throat> teachers or advisors. I needed time off to reflect and read and meditate and study and, re and acquire the information that would lead me on a new path. I call this the journey of transformation. And it, it's, it's an article that I wrote just uh, a few years ago. It's uh, posted on the MIA, the Mad, the Mad in America site. And that's the story in a very relatively concise form. It's not a, just a long article. My parents <clears throat> determined that I, that I was to be the person they had raised me to be, the person they had conditioned me to be. I rejected that, and they thought I was rejecting them, and they responded to that by insisting that I see a psychiatrist. Well, I wasn't about to see a psychiatrist because I had read enough about psychiatry to know that it wasn't for me. But eventually they decided that they were going to have the psychiatrist visit me and I was committed to a psychiatric institution for seven months, and, and as Matthew explained, I was administered against my will, a lot of psychiatric drugs, 
for 50 of these insulin coma treatments and 35 electroconvulsive shocks. These shock treatments wiped out a good part of my memory, including the three-year period that preceded my being locked up. The most wonderful period in my life from my point of view, because it opened me up so much. I was becoming the new person I wanted to be. And psychiatry was there to intervene, stop the process, and actually regress me back to the person I had been before I started on my journey. This is what's one of the things that psychiatry is doing to people. It's not only people who are undertaking the journey, but people who are thinking about undertaking the journey. Because that's always a threat possibility of their running afoul of the psychiatric police and getting locked up and being assaulted almost certainly with psychiatric drugs and sometimes with electroshock which they use quite a bit today a lot more than people are aware of by the way but i eventually was released from the institution without my college and high school educations and the, and the memories from that three-year period and I entered back in the world and immediately returned my, to my studies. I remembered reading certain books and I went back, reacquired those books and read them and studied them and learned not only what was in those books, but new learning as well, because I didn't limit myself just to the books that I had read. And then I, I, I got involved in, in uh, the business world again. For a while, I, I, I worked for, for an art gallery and then opened my own gallery. And then I joined Madness Network News and the Network Against Psychiatric Assault. And we ran our campaigns in San Francisco early on. And that was really the beginning of the, psychi the psychiatric survivors movement. But the movement continues. And it needs to expand. The fact that I have this group here is wonderful. But you know there are really millions of people who could benefit from hearing these talks and participating in this demonstration. They are not speaking out. They're not speaking out because perhaps for some, because they've lost a part of their memories, because their abilities to articulate their views are not that sharp, and perhaps out of fear that they could get locked up again if they were to speak out against the system. You know, the American Psychiatric Association is celebrating, in a sense, the release of their Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Diseases, which is really a farce, a comedy of errors. Uh, I'm a little bit disappointed in them, not owning up to the fact that, that John Stewart and, a, and, and members of his comedy, comedy writers team did not, were not mentioned as contributors to the to the new <laughs> Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, because it is, it is a farce in many, many ways. Uh, someone like Thomas Insel, who is the uh, uh, director of the National Institute of Mental Health, has come out and said that he dismisses this book because it lacks scientific validity. Well, if it doesn't have any scientific validity, the diseases with it, which they're listed in, which are listed in it, have no scientific validity. And if that, in fact, is the case, then these psychiatrists, these are just fake doctors using fake treatments on fake patients with fake diseases. This is clearly an example of fakery on a huge scale involving Tens of millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people work in this field and are devoted to the persecution of individuals who for whatever reason will not or cannot fit into the larger society. And that's the role that psychiatry plays. And that's why they're paid so well because they do, they have the job of enforcing the social mores of our community. I was going to talk a little bit about Cyprexin. Most of you have probably heard about that drug. Oh, yeah. It is the most powerful and therefore the most destructive of psychiatry's 
uh, atypical antipsychotic drugs. The drug was introduced in 1996 with a, a flurry of articles about its wonders. The articles mentioned nothing about the number of people who died in the study which was submitted to get the approval of the FDA. Robert Whitaker, in his wonderful book, Bad in America, was able through the Freedom of, Fin Freedom of, of Information Act, was able to get hold of the studies themselves. And he read them, and what he discovered was that there were 20 people who, amongst the 250 people who participated in the study who had died during the study which lasted over a two-year period. That comes out to one in 125 deaths. That was not reported. And with great enthusiasm, the psychiatrists started describing these drugs without knowing a major fact about them. Well, Eli Lilly, a couple of years ago, three or four years ago, admitted that 23 million people worldwide had taken this drug if you extrapolate from that figure of 1 in 125 to the 23 million, you have 100, more than 180,000 deaths from this one drug. And there are many of these psychiatric drugs out there that are killing people and causing them to suffer. And the public is taking it, the public buys into it. There are tens of millions of Americans alone who are taking psychiatric drugs including 10 to 15 million children. Can you imagine that? Children taking these drugs as a result of which their lives are shortened, they're dying prematurely, they suffer enormous disease, pain from, from, their disease, from the diseases, not of mental illness, but from the diseases brought on by the drugs that they're taking. You know, there's a tremendous irony tragic irony as well in psychiatry. Psychiatrists are claiming that mental illness is a, brain, like a disease like any other illness. And more specifically, it's a disease of the brain, a brain disease. The ironic thing is that they've never been able to establish that fact scientifically. Instead, what they do is they produce the very brain disease that they're supposed to be treating and dealing with. And no one calls them. Here they're arguing, here they're arguing about three or four hundred different diseases, and no one is raising the question, hey, wait a minute, what is the disease? Are these real illnesses? Where are the pathological reports that indicate that it is a disease in the medical sense of that term? Where are the laboratory tests? These people are just fakers. We should recognize them as such. And they don't want to hear the truth. We should be inside that building now talking about what psychiatry does to people. But we haven't been invited in. They don't want to hear from us. We're the crazy people out here. So the... You know... I and others have psychiatry is sham medicine. Psychiatry is religion and politics masquerading as medicine and science. There's no basis for it, science. Psychiatry, in my view, is an update of the Inquisition. It serves the same function in society, to suppress people. It's the Inquisition updated, spread out, worse than ever, more intense than ever, in terms of the numbers of people who are being under the fold of the psychiatrists. It's time for it to stop. The last thing I want to say is that I started off mentioning the fact that I was on a spiritual quest, it was a spiritual journey. 
The journey continued. They tried to stop it, but they failed. But speaking about what psychiatry does to people, if the, if the, if the body, as I believe, is a temple of the spirit, and the brain may be seen as the body's inner sanctum, the holiest of holy places, to invade, violate, and injure the brain, as psychiatric drugs and electroshock unfailingly do, is a desecration of the spirit and a crime against the soul, which is the presence of God in every living creature.